Hello, everybody. How we doing? How you doing, Fernando? I am okay. You're okay. How are, how are you? I'm good. I'm like super pumped up. I don't know why I'm like super alert, wide awake. I'm excited to talk about our topic today. And I guess our topic today is going to be uh, vampires, but not uh, sparkly ones from Twilight. They're uh, Vermont vampires, actually. I remember going to the midnight premiere of one of the Twilight movies when I was in high school. Um, was it a date or was it just your... It was a date. Okay. Because I, I, I never finished the franchise. Oh, at least you went that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I just, it's always funny because that's one of those movies that, and I don't care if someone's interested in going to see it, go for it. You do you. But I don't think I've ever met a guy who's at least admitted to going to see it. Well, that's okay. They well, to. Don't, don't generalize. Don't like, don't uh, assume that men can't like Twilight, dude. That's why I just said, I don't mind. I don't care if men like Twilight. You could go. Yeah, but for then it. you said that, like, oh, I've never met a man. <laughs> I haven't. I've never met a guy who's been like, they're always, but like, I they went to go ex- see. They exist, they is do. what I'm telling you. Yes, I know they exist, but no one will admit it. That's what I'm trying to say. I think I've, people will admit it if they're a fan of I've Stephanie the, Meyer's work. I mean, I, I've never seen it, but I mean, I love Harry Potter and shit, so I'm not going to, you know, I like stuff kind of like that shout out robert pattinson cedric diggory <laughs> and edward cullen dude there's the remake coming so I'm, of what harry oh yeah hbo yeah. harry potter i'm i have high hopes for it maybe they'll get it right and make ron and her or ron and maybe they'll get it right and it'll be harry and hermione in the end but i guess this is not a harry potter podcast <laughs> i mean week. it should be right <laughs> Uh, so anyways, today, everybody, we're talking about the great New England vampire panic. Uh, if you don't know what that is, essentially, a bunch of people throughout rural New England believe that vampires were preying upon themselves and their loved ones and sucking the life out of them. However, thanks a lot, Edward. <laughs> yes, there was no, like I said, there was no sparkly vampires in this situation. Though. We don't know that. <laughs> Okay, you're right. Maybe, Were you there? I was not there. Okay, I apologize. I was not there. Maybe, maybe we'll figure out something. We'll exactly. learn something. We can come to some, some conclusions at the end of the podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, without further ado, I'm going to get us going. So, the event that would become known as the Great New England Vampire Panic wouldn't be widely reported on until the late 1800s. However, just because it wasn't reported in the papers beforehand doesn't mean that small communities weren't acutely aware of the alleged vampirism that was sweeping the northeastern United States back in the late 1700s. During this time, people noticed that individuals within their families and townships began experiencing bizarre and deadly symptoms. This included the likes of severe fever, weight loss, sunken eyes, profuse sweating, a beet red face, emaciation and a violent and bloody cough the result of all this would be an appearance that looked as though their very life force was being drained from their bodies sadly this would almost always result in the individual succumbing to an extremely painful and drawn out demise naturally as individuals continued to pass people became frightened and attempted to figure out just what was plaguing their loved ones mixing the fear of becoming the next victim the emaciated state of the sick and a dash of superstition, the idea that it was vampires sucking the life out of people began to circulate throughout the region. But who were these vampires, and where were they coming from? Well, after assessing the increase... The Cullen family. The Cullen family? Mm. (laughs) Was it actually like a family? Yeah, well, I I don't know... God, I don't know if they were actually related, but like they basically, for appearance sakes in the movies, they basically were like, oh yeah, this is my son, like, and he's a high schooler. Just make it convenient. Like they had to basically, they had to blend in with the real world, you know. Like, ah, so, okay. Like there had to be a dad with a job and a mom or whatever, and like, oh yeah, this is my son Edward. He's 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 a high schooler. <laughs> no one ever questioned that he was sparkling in the sunlight. Well, no one ever questioned. Well, it was always gloomy because I think it was based in Seattle or something. It's supposed to always <laughs> good be cover. Like- That's a good place to go if you sparkle in the sunlight. Because Not there is Seattle, no sunlight. but the state of the state of Washington. But like, I've been to Seattle, and it was like. I went to Seattle in the summer and it was like 120 degrees each day. And I was like, how is this possible? <laughs> I had gone on like a record setting heat wave or whatever. I was like, this is awful. Oh, that, that is terrible. I, I've never really considered the Northwestern United States as a hot place, but it's, it's okay. usually apparently not. I just went at a shitty time. <laughs> Great weather, though. I mean, it was it was sunlight every day. But yeah, no vampires. Probably mm. all inside. That's a bummer. 
Well, after assessing the increasingly intense situation, people noticed a pattern forming. Shortly after someone had died from the apparent vampire attack, a family member, or even the entire family, would begin to experience the same symptoms. This led some townsfolk to do some old-fashioned New England math. When they put two and two together, the answer became obvious. It was their recently deceased family members that were leaving their graves and preying upon the living relatives. Of course it was. I mean, you would assume, right, if this is a New England math, that why not just stay up all night with a stake in a silver silver cross or something and be like and wait for the beast to appear take shifts and and then like you know what if the, there's no vampire maybe there's and they're still dying it's like well where's the vampire <laughs> maybe just maybe it's not a vampire i don't know the vampires were the friends we made along the way <laughs> you know the interesting thing is I, it's why you brought it up because i actually never thought about that it's like the first thing i thought about there's one situation that and it is not what you just said, you know. No, I did not find anybody staying up and, you know, waiting. I'm sure someone did. I just didn't see a report on it. But I'm sure there's like, oh, it, it knew I was here, so it didn't arrive kind of thing. And but then Jeremiah is dying all the same. Yes. Or oh, it can go invisible. I mean, I don't know. I'm just yeah. I'm just speculating how they may have thought back then, you know. It's eight it's the eighteen hundreds, you know, maybe who knows what they're thinking at this time. And for the record, in the 18, I know we talked about this a little before we started recording. In the 1800s, people started understanding, I mean, even a little before and, but like germs, you know, people were aware that it wasn't just spirits that were killing people. But not everybody believed that. And keep in mind, this is a rural area, a very rural area. And superstition, I'm sure, runs rampant in areas like this. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, uh, so according to Google, germs, like uh, one of the first instances, I guess, of germ discovery was uh, a French a French scientist named Louis Pasteur, kind of like how you pasteurize milk in the mm -hmm. 1860s. He basically uh, proved that food spoiled because of contamination to invisible bacteria, oh, not because of thing? spontaneous generation. So I think, you know, maybe that was like one of the first kind of things of germ theory. So it's kind of still new if it's the 1860s, because this is like, what, late 1800s? I mean, early new, 1800s. New, news doesn't spread that fast. So. Uh, so this was like pseudo that was like pseudoscience at this point. I'm sure people were maybe starting to suspect yeah, it. A, according to Harvard, harvarduniversity.edu, basically North America and Europe started to develop germ theory between the 1850s and 1920s. Hmm, OK, so it does. This does precursor that a little bit. One of the earliest events that may have allowed this theory to grow in popularity was the case of Rachel Harris in Manchester, Vermont. Back in 1793, according to NewEngland.com, <laughs> Rachel fell ill from what was likely consumption, what tuberculosis was called at the time, and eventually died. Soon after her death, her husband, Captain Isaac Burton, took her stepsister, Hulda, is that supposed to be Hilda? Hulda. Hulda? As his new bride. <laughs> you know... I mean, you know, it, it, I don't ahead. know. I don't know the I don't know the like the Etiquette? customs back then, but maybe like it's like, oh, the sister steps up because like her older sister. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's what I it doesn't matter. Sadly, it wouldn't be too long before Holda started having the exact same symptoms that Rachel experienced before her untimely demise. Womp, womp, womp. This led Isaac to hypothesize that it was Rachel who was terrorizing his new wife from beyond the grave. And sadly, Holda would also succumb to her illness. So, again, I don't believe in spirits, but if a spirit was going to come back and haunt and maybe hurt somebody, I imagine this would be a good situation for it. Like, oh, you came and you took my man? Okay. I mean, I think, what was it, in Netflix's, like, The Haunting of Bly Manor? I think yes. that's what happens. Like, they're yes. like... Like the exact same thing happens is like uh, the wife dies to some illness. It's probably like tuberculosis. And then the husband, which is her cousin, like marries her sister. But then like her sister like tries to steal her daughter's like inheritance. Mm -hmm. And then like the wife from beyond the grave like haunts and kills the sister, I think. <laughs> Well, don't don't steal the inheritance and you want to worry about it. Basically. If you believe in ghosts, don't do this stuff because the ghost is going to come after you. But you don't. So you're saying you would steal a child's inheritance. 
is what you're saying. Is I, I what you're would implying. not steal a child's inheritance, but if I was going to, that's not what would stop me. A ghost would not stop you, is what you're saying. I <laughs> yes, got you. there you go. In 1796, in Cumberland, Rhode Island, a man by... Shut up, Piper! <laughs> Jesus. Quiet on set! <laughs> Piper! Okay, hold on a second. Piper, I'm not playing now. Stop. Thank you. Continue. <clears throat> In 1796, in Cumberland, Rhode Island, a man by the name of Stephen Staples believed that his deceased daughter, Abigail, was terrorizing her very much alive sister, Lavinia. Like that other supposed victims of vampire attacks, Lavinia experienced all type of all the typical symptoms. Emaciation, fever, and a cough were all present. However, what set Lavinia's case apart from the others was the fact that she was actually seeing the vampire come to her in the dead of night. Hmm. I mean, was she actually, or was she making it up? I mean, if there's no vampires, right? If you're suffering, I mean, that's for, for it's for you to decide. It's for everyone to decide. But I will admit, if you're suffering from tuberculosis, um, I would imagine is hallucinations a symptom? Yeah, hallucinating would probably be. I mean, you're dehydrated. You have a fever. Your temps. I don't know what the hell it is. It's probably pretty high. Lavinia claimed that she was experiencing dreams of a creature that would come to her during her slumber and sit on her chest. Sounds like my cat. <laughs> Apparently, the evil being's only desire was to suffocate her. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no record of whether or not Lavinia survived her encounter. What do you mean if she survived her encounter? She probably, Like in the dream? No, tuberculosis. Or, or the, yeah, sorry, not obviously. tuberculosis. There, I don't think sickness. anyone survived from TB back then. Uh, we'd have to look. But I don't think of, medicine was around for that. I think eventually you would die, but you could prolong your life. Mm -hmm. um, like a lot of people were actually sent up to Vermont, northern New York. I would imagine New Hampshire, places like that. Yeah. Places that had, quote unquote, fresh mountain air. Oh, um, yeah. That's like uh, what they did in Louisville at the, what do you call it? Oh, what was that? The BuzzFeed guys went there. Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Waverly and Hills. I'm pretty sure those were... TB patients that were basically sent there because of the fresh air. So the town of uh, Cernak Lake, um, where I went for my associate's degree, uh, they actually yeah tuberculosis outbreak. It was huge. Like that was it, that was actually way the town made a lot of money was to treat people with tuberculosis. And there's a place called the Trudeau Institute. The Trudeau Institute took care of a lot of TB patients, mm -hmm. and um, since then it's been converted into I think apartments or something like that. But it's considered the most haunted place in the town. And they've actually had multiple like uh, ghost hunters and stuff go there. And uh, it's pretty interesting. Paranormal Witness. Is that who did it? Ah, that is it. Paranormal Witness. Okay, so they're not Paranormal as big Witness. as they're not as big as the others. But it was still, you know, it's kind of cool. No, I mean, that's always cool when someone comes there, you know. Especially it's a tiny town. The most famous account of all, however, is that of Mercy Brown out of Exeter, Rhode Island. Prior to her death in 1892, Mercy Brown experienced a lot of death within her family. Her mother, her mother had died from tuberculosis in 1883, and then shortly after that, she had lost her sister in the same fashion. And in just two years, Mercy and her brother Edwin also became sick and were in critical condition. And eventually, Edwin was sent away to the Colorado Springs for recovery, but sadly, Mercy would not be given the same opportunity. Instead, she would pass away at the young age of 20 and ultimately be laid to rest inside of a stony crypt at the local cemetery. Unfortunately, however, this rest would be a temporary one as her family and the community would begin to suspect that she was leeching the life from her surviving family members, as one naturally deduces. Yes, of course. At this time, one popular way to determine whether or not the dead body was actually that of a vampire was to see if there was fresh blood in their heart after dying. So what are we talking about? Digging up their graves at this point? Well, of course. What else did we do? I mean, uh, there's no way there's fresh blood in her heart, is there? Let's, let's Continue find reading. out. Continue reading. Mercy, her mother and her sister were dug up just two months after Mercy's death. Onlookers noted that Mercy's body looked remarkably well-preserved upon exhumation, while the other two bodies were little more than bones. This obviously made people feel a little bit uneasy. But after a brief cracking open of her ribcage... Yeah. It was discovered that she still had plenty of blood in her heart. And as you can imagine, this single fact was more than enough proof for them to believe that she was sucking the blood from the living. So they should have just put a silver stake through there, right? They, they could have honestly. Oh, no, done... it's wooden stake. It's a wooden, wooden stake. stake. Silver bullet, silver cross, wooden stake. Why it's got to be wood? I don't know. You would have thought, I mean, 
I guess back. I don't know. Back then, I feel you. Maybe they were just more. I mean, wouldn't the sunlight have? Like when they dig it up, wouldn't the sunlight have killed the vampire? I mean, suppose all this probably did was expose all the people that dug her up to TB. Probably, honestly, probably. I I don't know how long TB can survive inside of a dead vessel. Um, But you're the doctor. I am not a doctor. You always say that you're a doctor. doctor. (laughs) You say you're a doctor, and that I have to call you doctor. I said if I got. I said I'm almost a doctor. I'll never be a doctor, though, because I'm never going back to school again. Um, but if I became a doctor, Coward. I wouldn't acknowledge what you say unless you said doctor. Just to you, though. I would never do it to anybody else, but you. And I would never call you doctor, because I, <laughs> I don't respect you. Okay, how about doc? Can you just call me doc? Hmm. Maybe. I'd have to think about it. <clears throat> so now that you've heard a few accounts of how these supposed attacks affected people, you're probably wondering what the various communities did to fight back these evil beings, right? Well, they decided that the best course of action would be to dig up the bodies of the deceased and make sure that they would never come back to bother the living populace ever again. They were going to need to perform a ritual. Cue some creepy, spooky music. It'll be there. It'll be there. (laughs) As you could probably imagine, the ritual wasn't quite an exact science. This was the 18th and 19th centuries, after all. People still believed within certain circles that illnesses were caused by demons or evil spirits, or in this case, vampires. The contents of this practice depended largely upon both the region involved and the people who were tasked with performing the ritual itself. For the most part, the event would only be conducted by family members, which is very traumatizing if you think about that. Um, You don't want to put a stake through your father's chest in the afterlife? No, weirdly enough, I I don't want to do that. I, I know it's odd, but... I guess I'm an outlier there. (laughs) However, in some instances, town leaders and even doctors, people almost like me, were tasked with leading the service. (laughs) Rituals conducted conducted throughout states like that of Massachusetts and eventually Maine were typically quite straightforward. The body would simply be exhumed, flipped over, and then reburied. However, in states like that of Vermont and Rhode Island, the affair was a tad bit more eccentric. I don't really know why there was a regional difference. I don't know. I mean, New England's very close together. Maybe it's just the people. I don't know. Who knows? What are you trying to say about the people? I'm just saying maybe specific people. Like the first person to do it was really freaking weird. And it just so happened the person was from Vermont. And everyone else is like, well, that's how they did it. So we're going to do it that way now. Maybe. Interesting. I don't know. All right. In certain cases, the carcass would be removed from its grave and then the heart and possibly other organs would be cut from the body. Then they would toss said heart into a fire and breathe in the smoke. Okay, jeez, dude. <laughs> uh, apparently... How, how long does... Okay, we need a doctor. How long does T- <laughs> TB stay in the system? Because they're just asking for TB. <laughs> Up to 36 days. <laughs> yeah, that's almost within two months, you know? Like, if it was like a month and then early in the second month they started this, jeez Louise. Jeez Louise, dude. Yeah. So so this might be where everyone was getting attacked by vampires. <laughs> True. <laughs> Apparently, organizers believe that inhaling the smoke would cure people who are suffering from the supposed vampire attacks and stop their bodies from further wasting away. According to Smithsonian Magazine, in states like that of Vermont, these rituals were actually more like festivals, getting the whole town in on it. Remember the case of Come Rachel Come kids. <laughs> We're going to go see someone get their heart burned. We're all going to breathe in the smoke. We're all going to huff it. (laughs) Yay! (laughs) I mean, what else was there to do back then? I mean, you think about it. If I was on a farm all day and it was hard, you know, there's no mechanized anything. Everything you do is manual labor. You know what? If it gets me out of doing that for a little bit, yeah, sure. Why not? I'll go do that. (laughs) So, yeah, remember the case that you mentioned, uh, the case of Rachel Harris back in Manchester, Vermont? Well, the response to that situation was organizing was the organizing of a heartburning ceremony. During this event, Rachel's body was exhumed, her organs were removed, then the attendees watched as her lungs, heart, and liver were thrown into a large fire. Crazily enough, that event garnered so much attention that reportedly 500 people attended it. It's probably the whole town, dude. It's probably the whole state. Okay, come on. (laughs) According to organizers, the purpose of this event was to provide a sacrifice to the demon vampire that was supposedly sucking the life from the captain's wife. There was even supposedly a large gathering of people who attended the burning ceremony right on the town green in Woodstock, Vermont, back in 1830. 
been there. It's a very pretty town. Uh, additionally, the other cases that we had mentioned involving Stephen Staples and Mercy Brown were also handled in a similar manner. One odd deviation in the case of Mercy Brown, however, was that Edwin was actually fed the ashes from his deceased relatives during the burning ceremony. So he was basically told, hey, here's what happens when you don't believe in science. (laughs) You eat your sister. That's what happens. Yeah, he was was just like, what? It took a spoon. Let this serve as a cautionary tale. (laughs) (laughs) Trust the science. Trust the science or end up you'll end up eating your sister's ashes. There you go. There's a lesson for you. Unbelievable. Now, while all this may seem rather odd, to say the least, there were definitely even more grisly ways to prevent vampires from preying upon the living. For example, one common practice was to remove the parts of the body and rearrange them on top of the corpse. One instance of this was discovered back in 1990. So fast forward about a century and a half. Uh, This was when a group of three young boys in Griswold, Connecticut, were playing around a gravel pit. While they were there, one child noticed something white over by a freshly dug up area. Upon closer inspection, they quickly realized that the object in question was actually two human skulls. In a gravel pit? (laughs) In a gravel pit. So, well, I'll I'll get to this. I I, I think I touch upon it. Spoilers, bro. Police were obviously called to the site, and the area was immediately designated as a crime scene. I hope they arrested those three boys. (laughs) Oh, they got the death penalty. (laughs) You're arrested for murder. (laughs) At first... It was believed by local authorities that the bones might have been the remains of previously unknown victims of a local serial killer named Michael Ross. Ross, who had been incarcerated back in 84, had been convicted of murdering eight women across both New York and Connecticut. And some people believe that they may not believed that they may now be looking at some of his previously unknown victims. This theory, however, was quickly put to rest when it became blatantly obvious that the bones had been there for quite some time. Like over 150 years. So how is that obvious? Um, well, I'm not almost that kind of a doctor. So, but I, you I, always I, say that you are, though. <laughs> no, honestly. Um, oh, they probably. I'd imagine you could do like carbon dating or something like that. Plus, if you just mm. look at the bones, you know, I think bones when they get older they start to brown. So, you know, like if. But you wrote that they were white. White-ish. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Are you good? I'm good. That's just like <laughs> that is like poking holes in your theories. Never mind. I'm not gonna. It's not that. elsewhere. I like poking <laughs> holes. Yes, I know. <laughs> because it's a who liter- among us doesn't like poking a good hole though. Like I'm saying. <laughs> Continue, sir. Oh, okay. Thanks. Because this had quite literally become a historical excavation, <clears throat> the Connecticut State Archaeologist Nick Bellantoni. Bellantoni, Bellantoni, <laughs> was brought in to examine the site. <laughs> Soon after his arrival, it was confirmed that there was a whopping 29 individual graves scattered around the area. It would appear that the children stumbled upon a massive homicide. No, um, an old colonial era <laughs> cemetery. Old triple homicide. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you'd say 29, but a gigantic, ridiculously large a homicide. Massacre. A whole town was massacred by one man. I wonder if they were going to build an apartment complex up that gravel pit. <laughs> probably. It crazy. probably is an apartment complex there, not to be honest with you. Yikers. Um, so, yeah, it looks like they stumbled upon an old colonial era cemetery. Someone didn't watch Poltergeist. Th- these were actually, these are pretty common in a lot of rural areas just because rural. When, rural. when your family passed away, it was very expensive to go to the city. And besides, you'd want to visit them and you have all this land. So you'd want to live on top of them. Yeah, exactly. Why not? You never know when you're going to need to eat their ashes. It's true. <laughs> so at this point, everything seemed fine, and the whole thing looked like it could be chalked up to just stumbling across an old graveyard and nothing more than that, open and shut. That was, however, until burial plot number four was surveyed a little bit closely. A little bit more closely. Man, I'm messing up a lot in this one today. I'm sorry. I mean, you got three pages you're reading here, dude. I know it's a lot. I'm sorry. It's all right. I know you like being the center of attention. It's okay. Oh, well, yeah. It's typical Gemini behavior, dude. <laughs> Upon further inspection, Bellantoni and his team noticed that large flat rocks had been placed on top of the coffin in a very purposeful manner. This was undeniably quite odd and was not considered a traditional way to bury the dead in New England. Upon removing one of these rocks, 
Bellantoni's team was greeted by an even stranger sight. Unlike all the other coffins in the area, which were quite plain and simple, plot number four contained a smashed red painted coffin that had two bony human feet sticking out of it. Inside the coffin, the group discovered a very grim scene. The remains had been deliberately rearranged in an almost ceremonious-like fashion. The body had been decapitated, and the thigh bones and skull were placed atop the ribs and spine. Ballantoni recalled that it looked like a human skull and crossbones motif, a Jolly Roger. I'd never seen anything like it. After this discovery was made, most researchers came to the conclusion that the purpose of this practice was to simply ensure that if the body came back to life, it would be unable to walk. I mean, I guess if you don't have legs attached to you, you aren't going to walk, but you could crawl. And if you don't have arms, you could roll. So I'm just saying. You, okay, I think <laughs> no one's rolling. Do you? I, I, how, hey, they gonna, how are they going to roll out of the grave? I don't know. How are they going to walk? They're dead. Well, I mean, they can climb out if their arms were t- like intact, but like they can't they can't walk. I mean, you can't roll out of a grave, especially if it's six feet deep. Standard issue grave. <laughs> Standard issue. What are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh god oh i get to read really sir you, you get to read i know you're, you're welcome really you may, you may read <laughs> really can i <laughs> you can so far we have discussed multiple alleged cases of vampirism throughout new england during the 18th and 19th centuries as we have seen it appears as though the people who lived throughout the great new england vampire panic truly did believe that their family members were coming back from the grave to harm them And maybe even some of them joined them in hunting the living once they had passed. But were they? Well, to put it bluntly, yes, they were. (laughs) (laughs) No, they weren't. (laughs) Got me. (laughs) As you probably guessed, it was tuberculosis, a.k.a. consumption, as we probably said like 30 times already. Okay, dumb question. Sorry, I want to enter. I'm sorry. I, up until this, I always kind of thought consumption was like related to alcohol, like almost like poisoning from alcohol. Well, there is such a thing as called alcohol consumption, like death mm-hmm. by alcohol, like alcoholism, okay. just drinking too much alcohol. Okay. So there's two different kinds. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, I'll never, I'll never love you. <laughs> <laughs> as you probably guessed, it was tuberculosis or consumption, as you might know it. This, that was the culprit of this entire vampire epidemic. And during this time period, tuberculosis was running rampant throughout the settled portions of the United States, especially in New England. Uh, some reports even state that 80% of the population of North America and Europe had contracted TB by the end of the 19th century, and a further 80% of those 80% <laughs> who actually developed active TB would eventually die from the, from the disease. Let me do quick math. Quick maths. I don't know what it is. I don't either. <laughs> you know, that that is something that always, like, I know so many people died pre-medicine. Because, mm-hmm. like, I mean, obviously there's no way to treat bacteria without, like, penicillin or whatever medicine is needed, especially in the olden days. But, like, it must have been so scary to live in, like, cities back then or, like, large towns or colonies where, like, like you're just so in close quarters that, like, yeah, like, someone coughs on you or contaminates the food supply or like the drinking water. It's like, GG it's over. I mean, yeah, it was terrifying. And I think you can actually look at kind of some trends because I want to say it was within the, it was sometime within the past 10 years, I believe the world finally crossed over the threshold where more than 50% of the world's population lived in urban areas. So it up until like, you know, again, I'll say within the past 10 years, I don't know how long ago. I think it was much more recent than that. It was like within the past like two years. But anyways, for most of civilization, people have lived in rural areas. As crazy as that sounds, you know, when you're looking at, when you think about, because we know places like, for example, like New York mm-hmm. City, mm-hmm. you know, if you take the population of New York City um, and you compare it to the population to the rest of New York, I want to say there's more people in New York City than there are in the rest of the state of New York put together. And there's uh, lots You might be right on that actually. And there's lots of like large large cities throughout New York. Um, like Plattsburgh. Yeah, Plattsburgh's huge, man. Like Saranac Lake. Saranac Lake. Tupper Lake. Just, just keep naming all these big places, man. They're like the biggest places, honestly, dude. But but yeah, so 
I think people now, because, you know, medicine and a lot of other things too, the economy, medicine, just trends, opportunity, that's led more people to come to cities because yeah. it's a lot, it's a lot safer than it used to be, you know? But what I happens mean, when the economy gets sick? When the economy <laughs> gets sick. Um, so, so for those of you who don't know, um, we went to a museum up in uh, Montreal one time. It was like the, the natural, was it natural history museum? It might have been. And it's cool. Like, if you go up, I'll be honest, if you go to Montreal, it's a cool place to visit. But the uh, the production that they have you watch, the presentation they have you watch before you do the rest. It's government propaganda. <laughs> it's a little dated. Basically, uh, like, they're still saying that Indians, they gave us this land. <laughs> like, yeah, they wanted Amer to share this land with us. Yeah, Native Americans apparently gave the government the land so we could, you know, with nice white i mean so we could coexist with one another yeah it, it's that's a little anyways cringy. okay it's a little hard to get through. what made matters worse was the fact that tb was and is still extremely contagious during these times the idea of sanitization and sound medical science was far from commonplace couple this with the fact that entire families were living in a house together in certain circumstances and you got a recipe for disaster kind of goes to how i was talking about commu communities if you're like in a large populated area that's really condensed mm -hmm. and there's there's a outbreak it's it's curtains well and let's not get on this but um italy actually during you know the pandemic they suffered a lot more than a lot of other western no, countries i remember because yeah. in italy it's very commonplace to live with your relatives it's you know which to be honest the, the way everything's going with housing prices and stuff it might that might become more commonplace throughout more places than italy but anyways a lot of people in italy they're you know the contagion just flew through because their entire families and homes and it's kind of hard not you know like let's face it when if you have kids and they come back from school with the flu everyone in the house is going to have the flu <laughs> by by the end of the week probably so, some people like, oh, man, if that was my family, my dad probably wouldn't get it. My dad, like, has the strongest immune system. Yeah, that's a good thing. That's but, great. Like, uh, everyone else, like, I'd get it. My mom would definitely get it. And then, like, my little sister probably, like, wouldn't get it. <laughs> like, it's weird. It, like, definitely not everyone will get it. Like, I mean, there is a possibility, but depends on immune systems, I guess. I don't know. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason to germs. Immune system and a dash of luck. Dash of luck, yep. Additionally, back on topic, reports of vampire attacks dropped drastically soon after famous microbiologist Robert Koch formally identified the bacteria. Gosh. That's what I said. That's what I said. I said Koch. No, I said Robert Koch. Koch. That's what I said. No, you did not say that. I literally just said Koch. <laughs> Additionally, reports of famous vampire... <laughs> <laughs> It was Vampire Edward. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, additionally, addition, additionally, <laughs> oh, God, dude, let me get through this last page, please. <laughs> oh, okay. Mm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Additionally, right. <laughs> shut up, dude. Shut up. I can hear you breathing. It's pissing me off. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to look completely unenthused, okay? I'm going to look mm. unenthused. Additionally, <laughs> I'm dead, dude. <laughs> Get it together. <laughs> I can't. Oh, God, I'm crying. Oh, my God, dude. Oh, my God. From the top, everybody. <laughs> Reports of vampire attacks dropped drastically soon after famous microbiologist Robert Koch formally identified the bacteria that was causing this illness to occur throughout the population. Side note, Robert Koch also discovered the bacteria for both cholera as well as anthrax. And remember I had mentioned that Mercy Brown's body was well-preserved and even had an abundance of blood for a whole two months after she died? Well, one of the things I didn't mention was that she was buried in January. And for those of you that don't know, January in New England is typically quite frigid. 
Yes, it is. Essentially, she was basically pasted in an icebox. Think of a morgue, which would obviously preserve her body longer than normal. And that yeah. makes sense. New England winters are like negative 40. <laughs> like now it's like 40 degrees, but like 200 years ago, dude, it was, it was, it was quite cold, man. I mean, I remember back home, there was, you'd get days, you'd get like a week probably in February. I don't miss this, but it'd be like negative 35. And then mm-hmm. you'd have the wind chill, <clears throat> which would bring it up to, or down to like negative 40, negative 45. Yeah. And I know like, basically if you had like a diesel pickup truck, some people just like wouldn't turn it off because if you turned it off, it probably wasn't going to turn back on. Yeah. No, the, back in high school, uh, it was always cold. I think one of the days I remember going to school, like it was negative 20 with a wind chill of like negative 40. And I was like, it's like, what in the world is going on? And now like winters in Vermont where I grew up are probably like get as low as like means maybe. I don't think it hit the negatives once this year, once this past winter, yeah. which is crazy. I've never seen that before. So Mercy Brown, the one you'd mentioned earlier, who is po- quite possibly the most famous of all the vampires. Uh, Mercy Brown's story eventually began circulating shortly after it occurred around the nearby posh socialite ridden vacation land of Newport, Connecticut. At first, many people believed it was just an old wives tale meant to spook the city people and have a bit of old fashioned fun with them. However, it soon came to light that the horror story of Mercy Brown was not just a story. Upon learning of this grotesque information, local papers around the United States and even as far as London began running the story of the American vampire, as she was eventually dubbed. From then on, news of other vampires began to surface and make its way into new outlets around the world. The story gained traction and even began to pop up in horror pop culture at the time. Rumor has it that Mercy Brown, the Mercy Brown case, was so famous and intriguing that Bram Stoker... The man who wrote Dracula actually had newspaper clippings from this event within his personal files. Clearly, Stoker was a fan of Mercy and may have even used her as a bit of inspiration for Lucy Westenra. I think that's Westenra in his infamous book in his infamous book, Dracula. Even H.P. Lovecraft mentioned Mercy Brown's unfortunate circumstances in his book titled The Shunned House. I think it's Shunude. Schnood, the Schnood house, the Schnood oh. house. Okay, uh, I, I guess that's canon. The Schnood house, the Schnood house. So now that we've established that the Great New England Vampire Panic was basically just a fancy way to describe a tuberculosis outbreak, you can sleep well at night knowing that Dracula won't be coming after you the next time you visit New England. Now, Champy, on the other hand, that might be a completely different story. I really hope that's our next podcast, or else what the fuck is that segue? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's New England. That's, you know, Sasquatch and Champy. Those are. I mean, Annabelle's in New England. She's in Connecticut, right? I mean, she is, but she's like in the very rich part of Connecticut. Connecticut, honestly, is just like a rich thing. Connecticut's now. New England, though. It is New England, but it's not like. I wish I could bring up the meme because it talks about like, you know, that one where it's like, I'm doing my part. And then it's like, I'm doing my part. And then the guy's like, I ain't doing shit or something like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like showing like Vermont, you know, I got mountains and Maine's like, I got mountains and New, uh, New Hampshire's like, I got mountains. And then it shows Connecticut. And it's like, I ain't doing shit. <laughs> I'm sure there's more haunted places in like Connecticut oh, sh- in Massachusetts than there is in Lake Champlain. <laughs> hey, whoa. I've seen Champy with my own two eyes. Oh, have you now? He looked a lot like a log, though. On the weird. ferry? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> on the ferry. No, I have not seen Champy. And... Way to lie to all of our, our listeners. All 30 <laughs> of our listeners. All, like, 10 of our listeners. <laughs> and, uh, unfortunately, I don't believe in Champy. But I do want How dare you, dude? That's, like, literally our baseball team. <laughs> it is. The Lake Monsters. Exactly. And how dare you say that they're not real? Sorry. The baseball team's not real, either. Yes, it's they don't figment. exist. It's a figment of our imagination. People just sit in an empty stadium. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's the end of the Great Vampire Panic. And Fernando, you're our local believer. Hmm. Out of 10, how much do you believe this? Zero being none at all. Or sorry, one being none at all, I guess. Like that it was actually vampires? Yeah. Uh, zero. Zero. Okay. Zero. No, not even like nothing, nothing at no. all. No. Okay. 
Do you believe in vampires? Do I believe in beings that could live centuries? Possibly. I mean, Nicolas Cage is supposed to be a vampire. That one I don't get. <laughs> I don't either. It's just a weird guy. I I think you never know. You don't know the unknown. It's true. That's that's groundbreaking. You do not know the unknown. That's why it's called the unknown. <laughs> that's why it's a mystery. All right. And then that's why it's history and the present is a gift. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Master Ugwe. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, Ugwe is like turtle in Chinese. I did not know that. <laughs> Such a good movie. All right. So, like I said, that was a New England Vampire Panic. Uh, if you want to comment what you think, if you think it was real or not, or if you have any questions that we didn't answer, or maybe you know, there's a lot of information in there. And I really, really tried my absolute hardest to get everything in there. But please feel free if you if you're like, no, that wasn't correct. Please tell us. All right, guys, we hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you want to check us out on YouTube, you can like comment. And if you really like this, please subscribe. It helps us a ton. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, any audio only, please leave us a review. We would absolutely love that and consider following us um we'd love to have you tag along you know this is something we have a lot of fun with we want to or i think my goal personally is to get a community of people because i'd like to talk to you and figure out what your opinions are and we want to start a discord i mean maybe down the road but that's That's why people want it that's where people do community stuff dude that's where we have group group think in discussions but we need more than 14 people (laughs) to do that we do um so yeah the more subscribers we get the more we can grow this the more we can talk to you get your opinions and hopefully get to know you a little bit and maybe you can get to know us a little bit you know it's just we just want to have fun that's all this is so you know if you watch our stuff and you're like that's ridiculous it's stupid you know just we're having fun and we just want you to have fun you don't have to believe it i don't believe in most of the stuff we talk about that's his job um but uh yeah no and we value your opinion like Say what you want. As long as just don't get it. Don't make us have to get rid of something because YouTube can be kind of. See, I'm telling you, he's censoring you. (laughs) No, I just I want your comment to be there. I don't want to have to, you know, be forced by YouTube to moderate it. Only if it's positive, though. (laughs) It doesn't have to just be positive. So. So, yeah, that was the show, guys. Um, I get it, guys. Sometimes I want to leave a hateful comment. (laughs) (laughs) So that's it, guys. Um, Fernando, do you got any final thoughts? Yes, please subscribe to our sister channel uh, at You Go First Gaming. Uh, we are at 226 subscribers. We would really like to hit 500 before our biggest video falls off of our watch hours. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. That would be super. <clears throat> all right, guys. Those are the plugs. That's all we got. We hope you had a great time. And remember to stay spooky, everybody. Yep. Bye-bye.